Hello Cornerstone family, my name is Paula and today's devotional is entitled, The Spirit Transforms Us. Our core scripture is 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. And I'm gonna read it to you out of the Fire Bible and then the Passion Translation. Fire Bible says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, seeing the glory of the Lord with unveiled faces, as in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. Let me tell you how it reads in the Passion Translation. It says, Now the Lord I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit, and wherever He is Lord, there is freedom. We can all draw close to Him with the veil removed from our faces, and with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus. We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is spirit. Amen. So let's break it down a bit. There are three important lessons the Lord is teaching us in this verse. One, who he is. Two, what our response to him should be. And three, his intention with our lives. So let's look at them one at a time, starting with number one, who he is. The verse says that the Lord is the spirit. And recall from our anchor verse this year in Romans 8, 11, that the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive and dwelling within every follower of Christ. So let's take a peek at the English word that we read as Lord to get a better understanding of who he is. When Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian church, he used a Greek word, kurios which means a person exercising absolute ownership rights and master with full authority and control. This is how Paul's Greek readers would clearly have understood his definition of God and their relationship to God. Now, this is definitely not a popular idea in our society. Absolute ownership, master, full authority, control. And yet, this is the rightful position that Jesus holds at all times in the life of his true followers, his bride, those few on the narrow path who know him and love him with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind. You've probably heard it said, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. In the church, we use another word to describe this devotion-driven, absolute ownership with full authority and control. That word is lordship. And make no mistake, it is an extremely personal decision that each of us makes individually at a deep heart level where our desires are located and not just one time but over and over again daily will we surrender to the spirit of jesus giving him full control over every single moment of our lives will we reject what our own heart thinks feels or wants to do that opposes god in any given moment unrestricted access to every detail of our lives absolute full all. Now, to be very clear, Jesus is Lord and King of the universe, no matter what we ever decide to do. But he's not automatically our Lord and King unless we desire him to be. So the question is, what will we do? And this takes us to important lesson number two, what our response to him should be. Followers of Jesus experience tension on a daily basis. This tension is the strain of being stretched to conform to the will of the Holy Spirit instead of the will of the natural sinful flesh. A million times a day, we face decision points at which the root of all goes something like this. Agree with God or agree with the flesh? Tension, conviction, demanding of a response. Our verse in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18 is super clear that when Jesus' followers respond to this tension with a demonstration of devoted surrender to the lordship of his Holy Spirit, resist the flesh and make the hard decision to agree with God, they receive freedom as their reward. When we take captive every thought and make them obedient to Christ, we are set free. Free from what? free from the endless traps that agreement with the sinful flesh will lead us into, such as unforgiveness, bitterness, selfish ambition, greed, lust, envy, addiction, scarcity mindset, fear, worry, 
truly the list is endless. The scripture is so clear that there is a way to experience freedom from the bondage of the desires of our sinful flesh nature. And that way is him. <laughs> he is the way. John 8, 36 confirms that if the spirit of Jesus sets you free, you will be free indeed. Really, truly, and you can be certain of it, free. So let's recap so far. The Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ is the living Lord. And when we respond to his promptings to choose his way over our way, making him Lord of every moment by surrendering to his control in every minute and decision a million times daily, then we experience the true freedom that Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead to make available to us. Choose lordship. Surrender yourself. Experience freedom. Okay, that brings us to important lesson number three, his intention with our lives. Recall the verse says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. God's intention with your life is not to make you a better version of you. His intention is not to suppress your sin nature and dress you up with an outer appearance of Christ-likeness. No, his intention is to make us new, to transform us into his image. Grasp that for just a moment. By choosing his lordship in those hard emotional moments, in those moments when you want to tell yourself, oh, it's okay, he'll forgive me. By resisting the constant pull of your flesh to take you away from intimacy with your first love, Jesus. Yes, by resisting sin and chasing after Jesus with all, you experience him increasing on the inside of you. You feel his spirit changing you. This is the freedom. It's not just that you had a moment of feeling better. It's that progressively over time, you are better. I love the way the Amplified records Jesus' word in Matthew 5, 48. He says, you therefore will be perfect, growing into spiritual maturity, both in mind and character, actively integrating godly values into your daily life as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Holy Spirit transforms us. He intends to progressively transform every surrendered disciple into the same image as Christ. Paul tells the Colossian believers that Christ in you is the hope of glory and that the Holy Spirit is effectively working in him so that he can present every person complete in Christ, mature, fully trained, and perfect in him, the anointed one. He desires to make us more and more like his glorious Lord, like our glorious Lord Jesus, as we surrender to his Lordship and cooperate with the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. Woo! That sounds amazing, and it truly is. It's truly miraculous. What a precious promise. So how? How does the Spirit transform us? Because if you haven't noticed, most people don't like change. But even those who do want change typically want to shortcut the process that leads to that change. But more than any other way I've read in Scripture, the Holy Spirit transforms us using trials, tension, this is how he purifies and refines us when we choose his lordship over our own will. Let's look again at Paul's words, this time in Ephesians 4, 21 through 24. Paul writes, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, okay, you now have options. You have options. You have the truth of Jesus and you have your sinful nature. He says in verse 22, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Transformation is not automatic. We have a part to play. Our cooperation Paul is telling us what Jesus told us. Yield, give way, press into the tension, recognizing the Holy Spirit, convicting your heart to turn aside from your flesh and turn towards his will right now. When we do that, we put off the former way of life in the old nature, which our desires have corrupted. Paul is telling us what Jesus told us. Press in, turn aside right now. Philippians 2.13 uh, 2, 12 and 13 tells us that we must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. 
Paul spoke to this. He understood this tension. He said these words. He said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But he also comforted us and encouraged us by reminding us that God is working in us. God is working in you, the Holy Spirit, giving us the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Paul reminded us of the Holy Spirit's transformational intentions in our lives in Galatians 4.19. He says, until Christ is completely and permanently formed within you. There is so much more to say on this subject beyond the bounds of this devotional, but I hope that this time has blessed you and has challenged you to examine the Lordship of Jesus in your life. Is the Holy Spirit made Lord in your life? As well as examine your own expectations of your journey with Jesus. Is transformation your goal as well? If so, then rejoice in the tension and the trials because you know that he is producing his character within you. And that is truly an amazing miracle. I will leave you with this final thought from Ephesians 3, 20. The Holy Spirit is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or imagine according to his power at work in us. May the Lord richly bless you, Cornerstone, my brothers and sisters, and ignite a fire in your heart as you surrender all to him, all for his glory. Amen.